everyone. So I'm Luann Budd. I'm the president of the Network of Evangelical Women in Ministry. And today we have Arlen with us, who is going to be talking with us about his 10 years of research um, looking at the life of Henrietta Mears. And I um, ministered, um, my husband was a pastor in pastor. Southern California for years and um, not too far from Hollywood Press. And I was just surprised at why don't I know more about Henrietta Mears, especially if she is the mother of modern evangelicalism. I thought we just need to know more about her. So Arlen, thank you so much. I know that you um, were a professor of history at Whitworth College um, and that you at least for what you said in your book, you spent 10 years going through her papers. I thought it was hilarious to read where your wife was feeling like maybe you had a mistress because <laughs> you go upstairs <laughs> to read all of the journals yeah. and the papers of yeah. Henry Ademir. So um, just share with us, you know, why you fell in love with um, the, you know, Henrietta and why you wanted to tell her story. Um, well, good question. Well, it's interesting because I, I we were talking beforehand, and I had mentioned that I grew up in Southern California, and I didn't realize until I started this research that my home church pastor, our assistant pastor, and our Christian education director were all Henrietta Mears' guys. Really? She was, yeah, she had. They looked to her as kind of their mentor. Uh, I grew up on gospel light uh, curriculum uh, in the '50s and the early '60s. Uh, I went to Forest Home. You mentioned Forest. I went to Forest Home. I, in fact, I would drive our church bus up there to take kids up to the Rancho or one of the other sections of the camp. So, and when I first came up to Washington State in the summer of '73 to work uh, for a summer in a in a church in the Yakima Valley, uh, we we uh, were assigned to read the, the book that probably most people have seen if they've seen any of the other books about her, uh, called Henry and Mears and How She Did It. Um, and it was done by two of her assistants at the Hollywood Church. And uh, so we were, I never got through the entire book, uh, but I got through enough of it to realize, you know, I had some connections to her. And then I've been involved in uh, the UPC USA at various levels for most of my life and realized I kept bumping into her. And um, about, boy, it's probably. It's probably almost 20 years ago now, but I, I used to get a, uh, the Presbyterian Church USA used to have an organ called Reform. It was kind of from the renewal group within the church. And I, I got their newsletter and Gary Demarest, who had been at University Presbyterian Church in, in Seattle there, uh, Luann, close to where you were, um, was uh, writing, a, wrote this little blurb about Henry the Mears and what she meant in his life. And so I kept that. I, I'm, I'm actually a Southern uh, 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 historian of the colonial South. Hmm. I've never taught history, Southern history, and I'm, I've only taught colonial America a couple of times. Uh, and so it's been a kind of intriguing study uh, or journey, I should say. But when I, I actually had a book published on a little town in South Carolina, and when I finished that, I was actually trying to track uh, this whole town. So I track, try to track families through four or five or six generations. And it was so tedious. I said, I'm not doing that anymore. I'm going to try and take one person and see if I can figure out how that person uh, affected things. And so that one person, after I finished that book, that was the one person I chose to look at. And that's kind of how I came to it. But I, I, it, what's so intriguing to me is I never realized all the connections I had to her growing up in Southern California without even knowing it. Right. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I felt that way, too. I was like surprised at how much influence she had that I was doing some of her um, ways of, of doing mm -hmm. ministry. And I just thought that that was the way ministry was done. I had no idea that it was really Henrietta Mears idea that had just been handed down, handed down. So that's great. Can you um, as we begin, can you tell us a little bit about what what you feel like the, the state of the church was in, you know, this modernist, fundamentalist controversy, and kind of what was going on in evangelical, you know, before, like at the beginning of Henrietta, you know, starting to work at the, was it Riley's church at the beginning? Yeah, in, yeah. in Minneapolis, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she was born in 1890, which was the same year that Amy Semple McPherson of the International Church of the Fair Work, uh, 
International Church of the Foursquare Gospel. She was born the same year. They were born the same year. In fact, their their uh, their burial sites are about a quarter of a mile from each other at uh, Forest Hills uh, Glendale, which is intriguing. But anyway, um, she uh, she was so in eighteen nine by eighteen ninety the impact of Darwinian evolutionary theory uh, had really kind of filtered into kind of the the church itself. So the big controversy obviously was. Is creation right or is Darwin right? And so, and again, it, 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 as we know, it's a much more complex issue than it was at that particular time. But back then, that's kind of what it was. Do you take the Bible as to what it says or you follow science? And it's an artificial distinction, but it was, it was a big one back then, a huge one back then. And so the church, you know, splits into this group. The, the modernists would uh, tend to uh, believe more in modern science that, and take issue with some of the historic doctrines of the church. Now, not all modernists did that, but most of them, most of them did where, well, was Jesus really God? Uh, is the scripture really inspired by God or is it just written by people? And was Jesus was a good guy or what, you know, so that these kinds of controversies that of course we still hear about today a lot. Uh, a lot of the modernist church moved in those kinds of directions. And the reaction to that comes to be known as fundamentalism. Um, Back in, oh, I think it was the first decade of the 20th century, there, there were a, a series of um, uh, books that were published and distributed free to any pastor in the country called The Fundamentals. And uh, major theologians of the time uh, wrote on various aspects of Christianity, uh, you know, the, the various doctrines, uh, important movements within the church. And, and this particular uh, group of folks, it was actually financed, the, the fundamentals were actually financed by Union Oil Company executives, Lyman Stewart, his brother Milton. Uh, they, they kind of fronted the money for all this, which was a, a fair bit of change at that particular point in time. But in any event, what happens by 1910 or so is that you have this real strong break between the fundamentalists who are saying, we're holding the fundamentals of the faith, the historic doctrines, the Trinitarian theology, that sort of thing. And the modernists who, again, were more willing to kind of play with that and, and think, well, maybe we have to kind of modernize the church. We have to move it into the 20th century and that sort of thing. And so by the time Henrietta is, um, you know, a, a, a young girl, uh, a young woman, I should say, uh, this the church is really fractured. Now, she, her folks moved around a fair bit when she was younger, but they eventually settled by the time she was nine in Minneapolis and started attending William Bell Riley's First Baptist Church in Minneapolis. And he was a, he was one of the leading lights of what comes to be known as the World Fundamental World Christian Fundamentalist Organization. I, I'm not sure that's the exact title, uh, but it was a it was a national or is it an international organization that was based on perpetuating again the, the belief in the fundamentals of the faith. And so that was the church she was raised in. He very much was uh, in that category. In fact, he used to, um, he actually challenged a lot of the secular education, including the University of Minnesota, which is right there in the Twin Cities. Um, so that's the environment she grew up in. Uh, but very relatively early on, I think partly because of the influence of her family, particularly her grandmother and her mother, um, she kind of moved away from that real kind of strict um, um, she, she never got rid or she never uh, ignored fundamentalist theology. In other words, she always held to the fundamentals of, of the, the Christian faith. But the way it was expressed from, uh, from her perspective really needed to be adjusted. And uh, so Mears, as she grows to maturity, um, is not afraid of education. This is a woman who uh, majored in chemistry at the University of Minnesota uh, in uh, the early teens. Uh, she graduated with a degree in, in chemistry. Uh, she, in fact, she had a kind of a crisis of faith at the university when she took a biology class and, of course, was exposed to Darwin, Darwinian evolutionary theory. Uh, but she came through that crisis. As a result, for the rest of her life, she never feared ideas. She never feared education. And a lot of the fundamentalists did. Uh, the folks that were in that camp at that time really looked at... Um, higher education, especially if it was a, a secular uh, a higher education at places like the University of Minnesota, then it really was kind of anti-Christian. And so the real reaction against that among the uh, a lot of these fundamentalists. And Henrietta Mears, she really parted company with, with uh, them with regard to that. She also embraced, as long as it didn't transgress, uh, again, theological 
uh, uh, um, uh, theological norms, you know, again, Trinitarian theology and that, she really accepted uh, culture, uh, kind of American culture in the early 20th century. And that's another thing that a lot of these fundamentalists, they shied away from it. There's a real fear of it, not just education, but anything that, you know, seemed to smack of kind of secular culture. And so Mears really stood against that also. So by the time she um, she goes to Hollywood, she doesn't go to Hollywood until she's 37 years old in 1928. She already had served at Riley's church uh, for a number of years, had taken the Sunday school class of uh, three or four young women. Uh, again, this would be aged uh, maybe 18 to 25 or so. She'd taken a class of three or four and turned it into a class of 500. Uh, in fact, Riley's church had to build her uh, an auditorium to put the, the, the number of women in that class in, in one space. They, they didn't, didn't have any place they could put her. They, they kept it over the years between 1917 and 1927. She taught that class for 10 years. They kept having to move to bigger rooms because so many women would come uh, to her class. Um, she had a very strong sense of service, very strong sense of, of being uh, connected to the culture, but not letting the culture, of course, um, affect uh, them negatively in terms of their, their theological understanding and that sort of thing. So she really tread a, def, tread a fine line between, um, again, she was <coughs> never a moderate, modernist at all. She was very much a, a person that believed in the historic doctrines of the orthodox doctrines of the church, but she just believed that the way that Christians were expressing that, you know, and orthodox Christians were expressing that needed some, some kind of, uh, work. And so that's why I call her the mother of modern evangelicalism. I believe that in, as we look back, the, the whole neo, it's called neo-evangelicalism in some quarters, but the evangelical movement that supposedly started in the early 40s with people like, oh, Billy Graham and um, Rock and Gay at Boston's Park Street Church, um, uh, Bill Bright, folks like that, that, you know, that she's actually doing that 20 years before. So she and I, I, my my point in the book is that she, they're actually following her example, whether they knew it or not, in terms of what it meant to be a Christian in the 20th century and to be, you know, in the culture, but not let the culture, you know, dilute your witness and that sort of thing. That's amazing, isn't it? I mean, when you think about that, um, just the influence that this kid had. Well, while we're on it. I was wondering, um, what do you make of her father? Mm. And, you know, it sounded in your book that, um, that by all assessments, her mother was a really godly woman. Mm -hmm. And yet she put up with this husband who just seemed like he was a little bit sleazy to me. <laughs> Talk with us about is that a good, is word? That a good word? <laughs> well, it might be a little harsh, but you know, I mean, I think that we've got to be careful. You know, as historians, we're always saying you 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 can't judge the past by the present. Now, you can okay. certainly assess that. Say, well, they, they were blind by, by this, or they were blind to that. But in terms of saying, well, you know, this guy would, be, and and he's a great example. He, I, I'm still not quite sure. I understand him, and I studied him for a long time. He grew up in Vermont uh, and then moved to Chicago when he was about 20 years old. He took the bar, he passed the bar in Chicago, so he's a lawyer. But he went into, um, uh, well, kind of hardware business at that point. This is like 1860, 1861. Uh, he went into hardware business in Chicago. He made stoves and he he, he uh, sold uh, dishes and that sort of stuff. Um, and that, that's that's where he met Henrietta's mother. He started going to First Baptist Church of Minne of uh, Chicago, and Henrietta's mother's father was the senior pastor of that church. And so they met and um, uh, in uh, in that church. Well, he got involved not just in you know that, that sort of thing, hardware business, but he also got involved with with. The pastor of the church, which would be again Henrietta's grandfather. It's hard to kind of keep track of all these, all these uh, connections. But anyway, he got involved with um, uh, his future wife's father, who ran the church in an investment uh, uh, land development deal up north of Chicago. Um, it's and they actually founded the town of Highwood, Illinois. Uh, you go to Highwood, Illinois. 
these guys started that particular town. It's north of the, um, uh, on the North shore there. Um, but he, he um, there were a couple of years there after they got married, after Henrietta's mom and dad got married, that they moved to the East Coast for a while. And then they moved to the Dakota Territory. And this is where it gets a little weird because he goes full bore now into the land development mortgage business. And so he's in a little town called Ipswich in the Dakota Territory in the late 1880s. Uh, and gets involved. He actually was working for a, uh, a Wisconsin land developer at that particular point in time. I couldn't put that in the book because I had to kind of cut that part, but he, he's involved in this land development. He also is very involved in planting churches. Uh, he, and his, he and his wife, Henry and his mom, um, uh, planted uh, a church, in Ips, the First Baptist Church of Ips, Ipswich. When they moved to Fargo, they, they were some of the early members of the First Baptist Church of Fargo, North Dakota. Uh, but one of the things that happened was that Henry and his father, um, he founded about 20 different banks and there was an investment company. He even owned a livestock company, if you can believe that. So this guy was just, you know, all, in all kinds of stuff. This is where the kind of in present day, it might be kind of sleazy. Back, back then, it's really weird because he would um, try to get... Um, farmers invested in his company. He wanted to sell land to farmers because, of course, a lot of folks in the Dakotas wanted wanted uh, farmland so they could start uh, making some money. So he loaned them money, but he, he often raised that money by going east to, uh, and oftentimes in churches, and he would make contacts with folks that had money and try to get money from them that he could then put in his bank and then could, could be used to loan uh, funds to these farmers. Well, what eventually happens is he gets uh, indicted. And in fact, there, there as you read, Luann, he, he, there were about 30 court cases that uh, were uh, brought against him for fraud or misrepresentation or something. The, the uh, controller of the of U.S. currency, I mean, that's a national office. He essentially closed down a couple of Mears' banks because they weren't solvent. You know, he kept he would, um, we'd call it kiting today, is where you take money from one hand or one place and put it in another place that looked like you had funds there, but you really didn't. Um, and the thing is that today that's highly regulated. You're going to go to jail if you do that. Back then it was wide open. See, that's that's where it gets kind of weird. In fact, it was so was to give you an idea of how strange his, his situation was. He was actually booted out of the North Dakota Bankers Association for his business practices. About two weeks later, if I remember correctly, he was appointed vice president uh, of the banking operations in North Dakota by the U.S. Banking Association. OK, so he's kicked out of the North Dakota one. They know him better than the national folks do. But the national go folks make him, a, I think, a vice president. I think that was his, well, was his office. So, again, it's kind of it's kind of murky. I think what we can say is that his business dealings uh, led to a lot of insecurity uh, in that family. Uh, just a, I mean, they they were Henry and Mears in one of the other books uh, is quoted as saying, "You know, I was born with a silver spoon in my mouth, but it got yanked out before I got the taste of it." And that may be somewhat exaggerated, but that's really what happened. By the time she was four years old, all the money and he was he did. He was quite a uh, wealthy guy. I mean, they had at least one maid, um, a real nice big home in Fargo. I've got a picture of the, the their uh, Henrietta's childhood home there. Uh, but again, when those banks, there's a there's a major U.S. depression that happens between 1893 and about 1897. And so just as that depression starts to kick in, that's when the U.S. controller of the currency said, yeah, I'm going to close a couple of your banks and I'm going to investigate the rest of them. Well, just about the same time that happens, all of Fargo burns down, including this beautiful building that he had built. It was called the Mears Block, and it's where all of his companies were kind of uh, focused. That burns down, and from there on, it's just a series of court cases. In fact, there's one point I've got in the book there where the, um, uh, the deputy sheriff in Fargo is going to serve a warrant. Uh, and Henrietta's in there. Henrietta's only about five when this happens, uh, but her older sister Margaret's there, a couple of her older brothers, her mom's there. They won't answer the door. Uh, so the deputy goes to the back door, starts smack, uh, smacking the back door. They won't open that one either. And you can imagine as a five-year-old what that must have been like. Uh, you know, there's everybody in the house, nobody's answering the door. 
and this deputy is just like trying to beat it down to get in there. Of course, he didn't. But um, so you know, you have you have this issue. I think another thing uh, about Henrietta. Well, let me let me hold off on that. We're going to see if that that helps you a little bit. So definitely, he was uh, he died pretty much a pauper. Uh, in fact, he lived with Henrietta and her older sister the last two or three years of his life. He just, he, he, he in fact, he came out here to Washington once and was uh, thrown in jail uh, in central, in a jail in central Washington for a while because they, they said a check that he wrote didn't clear or something. Uh, so he was, he was trying to, ever, ever since the, uh, the, the uh, depression of 1893, 97, he tried to resurrect his career. And he never could do it and uh, was gone a lot. I mean, you mentioned her mother. I mean, he, I, I can't, I, I could never figure out how long he was gone when he went to these trips to the East or whatever. Um, but it was a long time. And Henrietta would write about that as a little girl. She would write to her older <laughs> brother. And you just get this sense that her older brother kind of became a surrogate father figure uh, to her because her dad was gone so often. Um, now, I've listened to the tapes that were done with Henrietta back in the late uh, mid 50s. And she kind of glosses over this, uh, her her dad in her mind. Uh, and again, you know, you, you think of the time and the um, the context of, of she's sharing her life story. Well, she doesn't share any of this. I, I uncovered all this when I was in North Dakota and I happened upon these civil court <laughs> records because she never said a thing about it. She, very, she only would talk about her parents in glowing terms. Uh, but yeah, there were there were some issues there that I think really led to uh, some real traumas for the entire family. Uh, but I think for Henrietta, that's where faith, I think Christian faith became for her kind of an anchor um, because she couldn't she couldn't get anchored. Her father wasn't a very good anchor for her, I don't think. Hmm. That's interesting. <clears throat> yeah, and I, I was just having a hard time thinking, how did our mother put up with this guy? Um, <clears throat> and, but maybe it was a different time. And as you said that, I think my grandfather was a bootlegger and <laughs> he, was, <laughs> he was being chased from New Mexico to Idaho <laughs> to Washington. <laughs> that's in our family too, I think. Law. So it was a different, a different time, I suppose. Um, <clears throat> you know that that's what, um, that's what uh, Aunt Graham Lotz always mentions about Billy being on the road all the time and yeah. mama left yeah. with five kids, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and Henrietta's mom had what she had two of her two of her her, her her older brother and her older sister died when she was before she was born. So, uh, but uh, four other fo uh, of her siblings remained. So it was a pretty big family too. But again, her mom had to had to hold down the fort most of the time as Henrietta was growing up because he was gone so much. Mm -hmm. Wow. So do others of you have questions that you want to ask? Or I can just keep going down my list here. <laughs> but if, yeah. you, if you have something that you're curious about or you'd like to get Arlen's perspective on, um, well, just feel free. It's not to here. <laughs> OK. Um, I'm curious about her love. Um, it seemed like oh. she fell in love. and. She was close, it seemed like, and then something happened and she kind of decided that she wasn't going to pursue that. So talk with us a little bit about the love of her life. Yeah, yeah, this this was one of those things that, you know, because the other books that were done on her earlier, one in the 50s and one in the, in the 60s, talk about this. And it, again, those books were based basically on her recollections. So in both... Um, uh, Henrietta Mears and how she did it, and Henrietta Mears' story, which was the first book written by her back in the, uh, uh, or written on her uh, by one of her uh, her associates at Hollywood Church. Uh, they all mention, or they both mention these. There's two guys, uh, but and they didn't mention very much at all about them. So I I tried to figure out, okay, who are these guys? Because you know, I want to I want to find a name. I want to associate a name with them. And when I was in um, uh, Minnesota doing research, I went to the little town where she was a teacher. North Branch is about, oh, it's probably about 40 miles north of the Twin Cities, and, and it's right on the Wisconsin border pretty much. She taught there for one year, and she started uh, stepping out with this fellow. He was a banker. We knew he's a banker, um, and I thought, because her, her background was Baptist, of course, and I thought maybe he was Lutheran, because there are a number of Lutheran, that's a kind of a Lutheran enclave up in there, um, but when I got a whole, I was trying to find these tapes that were done back in the 50s where Barbara Powers, who wrote this first book on her, 
is asking her questions. And I asked Barbara Powers, I said, Barbara, you know anywhere where these tapes are? And she said, well, I thought we gave them to Forest Home. So my wife and I went up there and looked all through all their tape, cat uh, tape catalog, couldn't find anything. Finally, and it said, because Barbara Powers had just died a few years ago, well, they found the tapes and I, were, I was able to get copies of them. And there's this real intriguing, and I kind of mentioned it in the book a little bit, this is a really intriguing part where Barbara Powers starts asking her questions. And you could tell that, that Henrietta Mears had written out her answers to some of these questions. So I can't remember what the question was she asked before about this, this guy you know, in North Branch. But you could just tell she was reading this, this thing. And all of a sudden, Barbara Powers says, well, should we talk about the young man? And all of a sudden, the tape just goes dead for eight or 10 seconds. It's just amazing, it's just completely dead. And then uh, I think Barbara Power says something else, and Henrietta still kind of hesitates. And then all of a sudden, she starts talking about this guy, and she never gives the name. Um, I tried, I looked, I, I knew she, he was a banker, so I looked up all the bankers in North Branch. And, were, you know, it's a small town, so there were only like two or three banks there. And I, 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 so I got all the names, and it must be one of those people, but I, I've never been able to figure out who it was. But what I did find out from these tapes is that he was Roman Catholic. Oh. And back at that time, of course, right. if you're Roman Catholic and you're, you're Protestant, uh, that becomes a bit of a difficulty. And um, yeah. she has this great story about talking uh, with him. They got really quite serious. I mean, from everything in those tapes and anything else I was able to, to find out, they were quite serious about each other. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, if you want to, we can even we get married and go somewhere else you know, where nobody knows you, nobody knows me, and we'll just kind of start over again. And so she really considered that. But then there's this passage that I quote, again, from one of the early books, and it's from the, the tape that she did. She said, be, if we married, it would be like uh, we're living in the same house, but we're not really eating together, uh, that he's, he's eating in the kitchen and I'm eating in the dining room or something, because there was that much of a difference, uh, she felt, between you know, Roman Catholicism in, in 1914 uh, and uh, Protestantism. And so they they uh, ended their relationship. What's intriguing to me, and this is this is a nice little side note, and if I'm running on, stop me, okay? Because I get going and I can just talk all day about it. <laughs> but the sideline was this, the banker leaves town for a while, okay? And so she starts dating the dentist in this town. And she thought, I think she thought, well, if he finds out, which he, of course, would find out because it's a small town, that I'm stepping out with his dentist, then he'll leave me alone. Then we won't. I think it was her way of trying to get around things. Well, the, the banker comes back and he, he, it didn't matter to him. He still loved her, you know? So, so eventually what happens is I couldn't find any hint that she broke up with either one of them. But what she did is she left town. She, I, I think it was really difficult for her to, to kind of end things with either one of those guys. And I think she wasn't terribly serious about the dentist. I think it was the banker she was really interested in. But she, she took a job without telling anybody. Again, she's in extreme um, Eastern Minnesota in uh, North Branch, right? She goes all the way across the state to almost the North uh, Dakota border to a little town uh, called Beardsley. And she just gets on the train and goes, doesn't tell anybody. And so these two guys are just kind of left in the lurch. But what's so intriguing is that in these tapes, as they as they went on, she mentions to her interviewer, Barbara Power, she said, well, you know, he just got married a few years ago. This is, again, the, the mid-50s, right? So he must have gotten married as quite an older guy. I don't know if he ever got over her for that long or what. But uh, it sounds like he carried a torch for her for quite a while. Um, anyway, so... That was that story. And she did meet another guy in Beardsley. Uh, and here again, you have these, these uh, strict rules for women, uh, teachers, uh, female te teachers. I, I went to Beardsley. I, I, in fact, I got to walk into school where she was the principal and the chemistry teacher and such. It was really an amazing uh, experience. But uh, she started dating this guy uh, in Beardsley. And the superintendent of the school district found out she was dating him. And she said, you will not date that guy. He had not a very good reputation. He was afraid of what uh, the, the, her association with this guy would lead to in terms of her reputation. And he said, you won't date him anymore. And she didn't. 
so there again, you have these strictures on women at that particular point in time. Uh, it's got a kind of a touching story where um, his mother, he, he actually left town. This fellow left uh, Beardsley after she broke with, uh, up with him. But her mother or his mother uh, told uh, Mears uh, before she left town uh, that she really changed his life, that he really changed his tune and he reformed and all that sort of thing. Again, I couldn't find his name. I I talked to, to archivists at Harvard and, and other institutions where these guys were supposed to have gone to school and I could not find the name. So um, they'll be always anonymous, but uh, both of those folks, I think, were a pretty big influence on her life. And she just decided after the fellow at Beardsley that she was going to commit her life to God. And again, at that particular point, it's oftentimes women had to make that choice, right? If you're going to be, if you're going to serve a church, oftentimes that meant that you you probably would not marry, uh, and that was her case. Wow, um, <clears throat> I think that's fascinating, and it, I think I've read various like missionary stories and different ones where it seemed like you know they would have a love, but then they would cut it off because they felt like it was going to keep them from being able to serve God fully. Um, mm -hmm. It's just um, something that's. I don't think that that's true so much today that I hear a woman doing that, but it seems like back in that day, that was much more common for people to do that. Yeah, uh, I think, I think it's, again, it's one of those tragic ways that, uh, you know, uh, that patriarchy kind of operated. Yeah. And, um, you know, she said one time, she, there was a woman that was uh, one of her protégés at Hollywood Church, and this is probably in the late 40s, early 50s. But she she was kind of a matchmaker in Hollywood Church. She was trying to match up her her uh, young men and young women together, and just just amazing stories about how she did that. But uh, one of these women uh, was uh, was really important in the in the college group, and she wanted her Henrietta wanted her to go to college in the East, um, go to a you know Bryn Mawr or one of the one of Radcliffe or one of the major women's colleges. Uh, and uh, she didn't, she wouldn't go, uh, and uh, Henrietta got kind of upset with her, and she got kind of upset with Henrietta, and she said, you want me to go because you want me to meet an East Coast guy. You want me to marry some guy from the East Coast, uh, and uh, Henrietta kind of admitted, yeah, that's what she wanted, and, you know, the, the, the persona that she projected was always, that, you know, in fact, the joke she would tell us, you know, I, I never married because St. Paul was already taken, you know, and those, those sorts of crypts, quips, yeah, and that's fun for, you know, big audiences and stuff, but, you know, that really, she really did struggle, because, I mean, she told this, um, uh, uh, this woman at one point, I don't want you to be like I have been. Um, so, you know, there, what peeked through there was what she had to give up. And, you know, again, one of the, one of the general stories as well, you know, I have, I have thousands of children around the world, but you could tell in this exchange with Barbara, she, she just, she, she didn't want her to end up like she did. In fact, she tried to, okay, one more funny story, then I'll stop again. <laughs> but one of the, she, uh, she had, uh, invited, uh, you know, um, the Oregon had um, uh, Mark Hatfield was a real important politician in Oregon back in the 50s and 60s. And in fact, I think he, all the way to the 80s, he, mm -hmm. he was an Oregon Secretary of State, he was an Oregon Governor, and then he became a U.S. Senator from Oregon, uh, served I don't know how many terms, just an amazing guy. Um, great Christian, a uh, single guy when he was, I think, Secretary of State. Well, Henrietta, of course, knew him, invited him to her house, and she also invited this other woman to her house. And this woman, uh, Barbara Spencer, didn't realize that Mark Hatfield was in the house. And so she, Henry had asked her to go get some coffee for her or something in the in the dining room or kitchen or something. I can't quite remember the, the details. But there's Mark Hatfield. And, and so she knew that what Henry was trying to do was to fix her up with the Secretary of State of the state of Oregon. <laughs> and she was livid. She was so, so upset because she was embarrassed. You know, you can imagine uh, having that set up and not even knowing about it. And all of a sudden you run into this guy. Anyway, I'll be quiet now. <laughs> <laughs> what a character. Oh, I tell you. So what do you think? Well, why don't you tell us a little bit about what, what you see as um, kind of the things that Henrietta introduced into ministry, um, how she um, mm -hmm. engaged the secular culture, some of her um, strategies, I guess, for winning people. Um, it seemed like she, um, I was, you know, dumbfounded by the story that you tell of 
for deciding that the president I was it of UCLA or USC needed to yeah. come and be part of the group. And so she went there herself personally and made an appointment and then yeah. led him to the Lord eventually so he could come back and be president of the yeah. youth. You know, it's just like, where does she get these ideas that she's mm -hmm. going to go do this? But mm -hmm. that about the idea of I want the most influential person in uh, that I can think of to become a Christian and now come into the church because I believe that people will follow that person's example. They'll want to be like him and then they will come to know Christ themselves. That kind of a mindset, I think, totally shaped how ministry was done at the high school level, at the college level. Um, and what is the kind of the, you know, 50 years later, looking at some of this, 70 years later, the downside of some of these yeah. things, the unintended consequences. Um, how did she help with the rise of the mega church? Even I don't know. So just yeah. I would just love to have you talk with us a little bit about some of that. Sure. Well, I think you know as I look at what she did, I think one thing that I, again I interviewed well between sixty and seventy folks that knew her personally, uh, and uh, this ranged from folks who would you, whose names you might recognize, major theologians and this sort of thing, to folks that you know I had never heard of before, just folks that were you know in the in the church and and that she supported. Um, but it didn't matter if you were a um, you know, a football star at USC, or if you were president of UCLA, or if you were a person that, you know, was just starting at a LA City College and uh, had to work part-time, uh, she took time to get to know you. Uh, and I heard that from so many people. Uh, it didn't, you know, her, her college class at um, the uh, First Presbyterian Church of Hollywood grew to over 800 uh, now they didn't all show up on the same day, but you know I've been in that room and it could fit three or four hundred in that room. Um, so you know she, but she made a point to make make sure she met every person. If they didn't duck out the side door, you know, uh, she made a point to meet those every single person that was there. And her sister, she lived with her sister for years and years, and Margaret was a big help to her. In fact, I don't think Henrietta could have done half what she did if Margaret hadn't been there, because Margaret kind of picked up all the slack at home and that sort of stuff, uh, did the shopping and, you know, shopped for Henrietta's clothes and all that sort of stuff. But I think that was that was a real major thing. She, you know, we talk about they'll know they're, they're Christians by their love, right? Well, that's how people were drawn to her. I think she always took time for folks. Um, she did single out some folks for leadership. Uh, you know, Bill Bright would be one example of that. Um, Gary Demers would be another example. Of that. There are all kinds of examples of these kind of these real bright stars. But she never she never ignored just people like like I would be kind of a wallflower, right? a person against the back wall or something. She wouldn't ignore folks like that. And I think from what I was able to tell from all these interviews and the, the reading that I did, uh, people knew that. Uh, people knew it wasn't phony. They knew that she cared about them and she really wanted the best for them. So I think that's that's a, a real important kind of part of things. I think it's a very, very significant part of things. I think she was also so confident. There's a there's a confidence in her that, uh, again, I wish I could she'd give me a transfusion. I mean, that woman was so confident uh, about, uh, you know, what God was directing her to do. And what he, she was, what uh, he was directing her to do for for her students and that sort of thing. Now, of course, that could play out in, in kind of negative ways. I do have a chapter there that really kind of talks about the limitations or the paradoxes in her ministry and her life. But I think that that uh, confidence did give her a sense of moving forward. She had a sense of the future um, and the possibilities of the future for the church that I just I just think was amazing. Um, uh, she, for example, I mean, this is the 40s and the 50s, right? And again, sex ed films uh, back then in the schools were really pretty tame, of course, compared to today's standards. But this is a woman who believed fully that any question uh, should be able to be addressed by the church. And so she would bring sex ed films in, from the L.A. City School District to play for her students, and then they would have discussions about, you know, sex and sexuality, that sort of thing. And to me, that is phenomenal when you think about that. 
uh, kind of the <laughs> this kind of a the love hate relationship that Christians over the centuries have had with sexuality. Here's a woman who is completely orthodox, has a biblical view of sexuality, and she wants her students to feel comfortable talking about those kinds of things, um, as well as any other question they might have in, in church, in Sunday school class, and that sort of thing. She also believed very, very heavily in Christian education. Uh, she oftentimes, when she spoke in front of groups, and I have a few, I think, quotations in the, in the book, uh, where she takes the church to task for uh, students losing their faith in college. And she said, it's not, it's not that they lost their faith. That, that we haven't given them a reason to have any faith. You know, we haven't taught them. If people really understood from their Sunday school education, um, good theology, again, age graded and that sort of thing, good theology, good Trinitarian um, orthodoxy, uh, they, they could meet any challenge that they would face. Um, and so consequently, she had students go to Columbia. She had students to go to, go to USC, Oxford, uh, you know, Berkeley. I mean, that's where Gary Demarest went to school, went to Berkeley. Uh, so you don't have a, she doesn't have a fear that the secular culture is going to invade the faith. What she's saying is we've got to build up, make sure these people have a mature faith. And she was 100% committed. She would have at college briefing conference at Forest Home, she'd have philosophers come in. She'd have psychologists come in. And again, this is the 40s and the 50s. This is really quite progressive uh, for the time. Uh, theologians, that, uh, sometimes the theologians didn't always agree with each other, uh, but they would hash those things out in front of the college students as college students could, again, Go up and interview them and talk with them without their, their concerns, their questions. The problem, Louie, uh, getting to your, your other point, is that when Christians, again, look to, to certain leaders to tell us or to, to kind of model faith for us, that can go very well. It can also go very poorly. And again, although Mears didn't do that exclusively, that really was her modus operandi from the moment she uh, went to Hollywood in 1928 until she died in 1963. You get those so those stars. Um, you you care for everyone, but you really try to elevate those stars. She had all kinds of offices in the high school, uh, the college department, and so she would install these folks in these diff different offices. I interviewed one fellow that he became a uh, Taylor Potter was a Penn State graduate. He came to Hollywood, got involved in the church, went to San Francisco Theological Seminary. And a Presbyterian pastor uh, just retired a, a few years ago, but he was talking about how he was kind of just a nobody, and she kind of picked him out because she saw potential for him, uh, and uh, again put him in a position where he had the lead, and uh, you know he had a, a, a really very fulfilling career as a as a Presbyterian pastor and leader. So uh, the problem, of course, is whenever you do that, then you become identified with those people, and if those people fail then that's going to reflect poorly on, on issues of faith. And I think we've seen that in spades, unfortunately, the last decade or so. Um, but Bill Bright would be another example. She saw something in him uh, and kind of poured her life into him. And of course, Campus Crusade is the result. But then when Bill Bright you know, started to move into, into political realms, uh, she always kind of shied away from those kinds of things. Uh, again, there's, there's an association there that could potentially be a problem. Um, does that, that help a little bit? Any, any other um elaboration on that you'd like or yeah. yeah it's interesting that she seems to very much want to keep politics and religion separated but yet other people have wanted that to in evangelicalism have wanted that to be merged do you want to talk right. about that at all yeah i think that's a that's a, a major major issue in the neo-evangelical movement um, Henrietta, for her, the, what was most important, I mean, she had these kind of three or four goals, uh, and the most important goal was to bring folks to Christ, okay? So evangelism was, was the number one priority for her. She also believed, however, that we have to serve this broken world, you know? It's blessed and it's broken, and we've got we've to gotta serve that. So that was always a big deal for her, too. Um, and her concern was that if we if we start to engage in social kinds of issues, whether it's issues of uh, um, female empowerment or race or um, uh, uh, communist, anti-communist kind of stuff, she steered clear of that. 
Um, and she's, she tried to maintain, again, the focus on Christ is going to call you to service. I'm not going to tell you what you should do. Uh, Christ will call you to that. Now, sometimes, uh, uh, as I say in the book, she, she would always tell folks, you know, I, it's not for me to tell you what you should do. That's for Christ to reveal to you through the Holy Spirit. But I think you should, and there's all kinds of cases where she exactly did tell them what they should do. And Gary Demers is one of those folks. But um, I think that that her she's tried to steer clear of any kind of engagement with um, cultural issues that could be divisive with regard to the, the ministry uh, of the church. Now, that slices two ways, doesn't it? Because again, she, she, she dies the year the Rumpert Fair Housing Act uh, came up before the California um, electorate. You know, I, I remember as a kid, the Rumpert Fair Housing Act. And uh, again, she didn't seem to have much to say about those kinds of issues. Many of the women I spoke with said she always supported us. She, in fact, um, uh, some of these women would say she supported us so much. She didn't, she didn't talk about fe feminism. She just lived it. Mm -hmm. um, and again, so I, I again, I personally, I'm still kind of uh, not sure how that panned itself out. But if I'm listening to the women that I spoke to, they they felt that uh, they felt that that she supported them. Um, but uh, again, there was this 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 sense that we 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 don't want to get too involved in social issues. And I think that 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 uh, in addition to the kind of uh, stars thing that kind of could go go terribly wrong and, and has unfortunately in evangelicalism over the last couple of decades. I think so also could uh, not getting involved in social kinds of issues. And I think the church um, is kind of paying for that at this particular point, because I think if you don't, if you don't speak out, um, for example, on uh, injustices for women or racial kinds of things or ideological concerns that are ideological and not faith-based, um, in other words, if they become faith-based, that's an issue. Uh, so and I think that those kinds of issues, um, in a sense, uh, and I'll step out uh, on a, a limb here a little bit, I think the evangelical church is paying for that today because uh, so often it did not speak out on these kinds of issues early on. Uh, and it's only it, it only became when it became those became bigger cultural issues in the 60s that some churches began to move in those kind of directions but i think mirrors was well intentioned um i again uh, folks would say that if she was alive in the later 60s she would have been a civil rights advocate or she would have been a feminist i'm not i'm not convinced of that she might have been personally but she she would not have been publicly i don't think uh, i think she always wanted to keep that that line between issues of faith and then cultural kinds of issues. But she did encourage her students. I mean, there are a number of her folks that went on um, uh, to get involved in fair housing fight. The fair housing fight up in Seattle, for example, a couple of her folks, Gary Demers was one of them, got involved in, in the fair housing fight in Seattle. Some got involved in the uh, fair housing fight down in La Jolla uh, after Rumford uh, and these kinds of things. So so she, she never said, she never told folks um, that you sh should or should not be involved. She, she would say that the Holy Spirit needs to lead you into your area of service. Um, and she kind of left it at that. So again, you can slice that both ways. She could be maybe taking a task for that to some extent. On the other hand, she supported her students wherever God directed them. She had folks that went up to the migrant camps in Central California, um, you know, and worked in the in the camps with uh, with uh, some of the folks that were uh, disadvantaged, obviously, from uh, the Bracero program and some of the other kinds of things too. So a number of her folks were involved in social action kinds of things, never to the exclusion of the gospel, but in addition, because the gospel tells us to go out and care for the widows and orphans and these sorts of folks. So again, I'm sorry, I'm afraid I'm kind of rambling on. Oh here, no, so. that's interesting. <clears throat> no. Can I just interject? Okay, just to, for if you could give me a little clarity on this. I totally understand where you're going. Your question, Luann, about her becoming involved in social issues, separate from my question is going to be, I was taken off guard a tad when um, Arlen mentioned that she uh, stepped out to bring sexual um, sexuality into training, into classroom, which back then would have been to me like, 
that would have been bold, right? And I understand the difference between maybe commenting on what was happening in the social scene rather than just her seeing a need or being led by the Holy Spirit, for lack of better words, that this is yeah, what her yeah. community needed to hear. Fine line, but still she was bold there. And then mm -hmm. I, I like the resolution, Arlen, of you're saying, you know, she didn't not she didn't say not to, but she didn't say to, but she supported right. where you knew you were called to serve, right? Where right. you were called. She just gave you the fundamentals of the truth of mm -hmm. scripture that went out. But then but for her to part that in and teach. Yeah. Uh, sex, sex ed, I guess, is what it is for a better word, yeah, was yeah. surprising to me. That was bold. Yeah, it surprised me, too. I, I was shocked when I saw it. And I can't remember what document I found that in, but I thought, that is so great, because there again, you've got this confident woman yeah, that says confidence. the church, you know, faith can, can answer any question you have. And this, of course, <laughs> is a powerful one that we all grapple with. Let's get it out there on the table. And I just thought, this is amazing. You know, I just mm -hmm. amazing. Yeah. And it's interesting that she so engaged culture and was not afraid. Mm -hmm. And and I was wondering about if she were to live today, do you have any thoughts on how she might engage culture in ways um, that well, I might not be thinking about? <laughs> <laughs> like like Ann, you know, Ann Graham Lotz always says, the Bible says. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. Any answer yeah. she has to any question they try to trip her. The Bible says. I've always remembered that. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a tough one. I, I I can let me share you share with you her involvement in the Hollywood Christian group. That because for that time again, it's hard to pull out. I think um, I, everyone. I mean, not everyone, but but folks that knew her well, uh, really well, her confidants, if you will, and there were dozens of them. Uh, they all said they knew exactly where she stood politically. Uh, she was pretty conservative. In fact, when I, I have her travel diary, she went down to Mexico and, and Rio de Janeiro uh, and actually uh, Europe just after the war. And she, they were listening to the radio. I, I guess this was her 1940 trip to Mexico. She's listening to the radio on election night and uh, Roosevelt had been reelected and she was not happy about that at all. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, but she never, she, she never taught politics from the, from the lectern. She, she just yeah. wouldn't do that because she felt it would be a, a distraction. But let me, let me uh, so again, it, that, that would be a marker. Um, for me to the Hollywood Christian group was a marker. Uh, and this is, a, this is a tricky one because she, uh, in 1949 at the, uh, uh, actually it was the same year that Billy Graham was up at Forest Home. This is a different conference. Uh, she uh, had, um, um, oh, I'm gonna forget her name. Um, she was a vocalist for uh, the Dorsey Brothers. She sang with Frank Sinatra. Oh, she just died a couple of years ago. Um, oh, I should know this. <laughs> oh, oh, Connie Haynes. Connie Haynes. Uh, she was a kind of a major uh, figure, and she was a, a born again Christian. She lived with Mears for a while, and she went to this conference in the summer of '49, and she really was trying to think, how can I reach other of my folks in the industry, as they call them, of course. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so it was that summer that Henrietta Mears helped co-found the Hollywood Christian Group. It was the first organized ministry to, uh, you know, the, the Hollywood set. And um, between 1949 and 1959, that, that group uh, included some of the major film stars and producers and directors and um, folks in the music uh, industry, uh, you know, in the country. Um, she always supported folks in the industry. Um, and the, 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 the trickiest one for folks, and I spent a little bit of time with this in the book, remember the, Jane, the name Jane Russell at all? Um, yeah. Really a very, very uh, how should we say this? Buxom. Uh, yeah. Lups, you could say voluptuous. <laughs> that was the other word I thought of. Um, I still remember seeing the, the, uh, uh, the publicity uh, poster from the outlaw going, whoa, mm -hmm. gee. Anyway, uh, Jane Russell was a born again Christian. And so Jane Russell became part of this group along with Connie Haynes and uh, Roy Rogers and Dale Evans were part of it. 
Um, the guy who headed up Mickey Mouse Club, uh, Jimmy Dodd and his wife were part of it. A lot of folks. Uh, in fact, Ronald Reagan was even peripherally involved a little bit. Um, Jane Russell even asked Marilyn Monroe if she would come to a meeting. And she came to one meeting and that was it. She decided that wasn't for her. But Jane Russell is an, an enigma when you look, think about, again, how she was marketed uh, mm -hmm. and some of the films she played in. Again, at that time, they're pretty, pretty out there, you know. And yet um, Ruth Graham tells this great story where because they asked Billy Graham to come to one of the first meetings of the Hollywood Christian group because his crusade in 49 was the, the one that really launched his international career. So he came to one of these meetings and Ruth came with him. Um, and uh, Jane Russell was in the in the uh, group, and Ruth tells Ruth Graham tells this great story about you know I'm sitting there thinking, geez, what is she doing here? I mean, she she's really quite the steamy item here, and she's in this Hollywood Christian. And um, as Ruth Graham is doing that, she's sitting next to Henrietta Mears, and Henrietta Mears touches her, and she says. I just love that girl. Isn't she the sweetest thing? And Ruth Graham, of course, had this terrible guilt complex because she realized she was judging Jane Russell without ever knowing her personally. Um, but I think that, I don't know if this is going to answer your question or not, but I think that um, she would she would be accepting uh, of a lot of what's gone on, goes on in Hollywood. But again, if it transgresses, again, biblical norms, she, she would stand against that. Now, um, I, I don't know politically where she, I don't think, uh, I think she would still stay out of politics. Even again, a lot of folks who knew her knew exactly what she knew, but she was pretty conservative theologically or, or politically, but she would never teach on that. I, I asked all these people, every single interview, I said, did she ever teach on feminism or race or politics? And to a person, never did. She never did it. So I think she would keep to that. I think she would have some real struggles internally, however, in terms of kind of where we are culturally and ideologically and such. Um, but again, that's that's that part of speculation on my part. Hmm. Interesting. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. Well, it's been an hour. So thank you, Arlen, so much for sharing with us. Do you have any other things that you think are interesting that you'd like to uh, that I didn't ask that you think we should know about, or um, how would you summarize Henrietta and her impact? Um, what what have you benefited from her life? You know, mm -hmm. maybe we'll be taking another five or ten minutes and just sure, sure, you know. no problem. I'm glad to stick around as long as folks want to, too. So I'm okay. not under any deadline. Um, I think um, what strikes me about Mears is how many pies her fingers were in. Uh, you, you know, and that's again where I, I think you cannot understand 20th century evangelicalism or even some of 21st century evangelicalism without understanding how influential she was. Um, well, I've talked about Bill Bright. I mean, that's that's uh, really quite uh, Billy Graham. You know, people realize that, uh, you know, it's that 1949 crusade that really launched his, uh, you know, world evangelistic um uh, career, if you will. He was a, um, a real kind of a small town uh, evangelist until that that particular crusade. But again, he was at Henrietta Mears's uh, house for this Hollywood Christian group meeting uh, in that 40, uh, during that 49 crusade. Uh, Billy Graham had his crisis of faith up at Forest Home in August of 1949, just before that crusade. In fact, he was so uh, kind of, he was already kind of wrestling with the authority of scripture before he went to um, Forest Home in August of, uh, of 49. In fact, I think he would have liked to have gotten out of his um, commitment to Henrietta to speak at this conference, uh, but she didn't know he was he was kind of struggling with his, uh, you know, the authority of scripture and that sort of thing. And so she, you know, she, you know, she was really glad he was going to be there. Well, while he was there, I don't know how long he spent with her. They, they prayed together. He'd uh, counsel with her and that sort of thing. And then it was one of those, one of the evenings as he, he's trying to struggle through uh, his own doubts. And again, he's giving uh, daily kind of uh, Bible lessons at this conference. He has a, he has his, his kind of cathartic moment of crisis and resolves it at Forest Home. Uh, under Henrietta Mears' ministry. Uh, and, uh, you know, he writes this great letter. I, I've got it 
partially quoted in the book where he, he, he goes back to, he has to go back to Minneapolis. He's based in Minneapolis. So after the Forest Home Conference, he goes back to Minneapolis, writes Mears a letter. And then it's about three weeks later after he writes that letter that he goes to LA for the beginning of the crusade. Well, this letter, he just, you could tell he was just completely floored by how powerful that conference was and how significant she was to his own uh, ministry and his understanding of scripture and that sort of thing. Um, there are other parts to that story, but it, it's, ju it's just unbelievable how integral her experience uh, with him was in his life and to other folks who were big figures in that crusade. I mean, Louis Zamperini, remember uh, Angel Jolie's movie, a couple, well, Louis yeah. Zamperini yeah. was taught in her Sunday school uh, class. Uh, he was, he was at Hollywood church, you know, um, the um, Stuart Hamlin was probably the most popular, well-known, popular radio personality in the West coast in the 1940s and fifties. And he came to Christ through Henry and Amir's ministry, and he's the one that had Billy Graham on t on his radio program. And then it's it's in that radio program where um, uh, Billy Graham again challenges Stuart Hamlin in terms of his faith, and Hamlin becomes a Christian at, at his crusade too, and has a, a testimony time there too. So anyway, so Billy Graham, Bill Bright, uh, but I think another intriguing thing is that Mears mentored so many people that we may not have heard of. But they, in turn, then mentored other folks that have had a tremendous impact on uh, evangelicalism. And let me just mention, she knew Dawson Trotman, who's the founder of Nav the Navigators, a Bible memorization program. Um, uh, but her, her real connection was uh, with um, Jim Rayburn, who founded Young Life, uh, that ministry to, to young uh, uh, high school uh, age folks. Jim Rayburn was in a church in Texas. Uh, that was pastored by one of Henrietta Mears' mentees, a uh, Presbyterian pastor, Presbyterian, Gainesville Presbyterian Church in Texas, Gainesville, Texas. And he had, uh, Clyde Kennedy had been under Mears' uh, mentorship when he was at Hollywood Church, took this church in, in uh, Gainesville, Texas. Rayburn then came into that church. And what Kennedy said to him is, he said, I don't want you to go to the church kids. I want you to go to the unchurched kids. And that's what launched Rayburn on his ministry. And he later said, in fact, it's, uh, I've got some good quotations in the book, where uh, Rayburn said, everything I learned about youth ministry, this is the head of young life. Everything I learned about youth ministry, I learned from Henrietta Mears. Okay. Uh, it's just unbelievable. You know, and then one of the, the, the person, one of the people that, that followed him as president of young life uh, in, the, I think it was in the 70s, he said that Mears' example helped Young Life to move to incorporate more women in leadership roles in the Young Life program nationally and internationally. Um, so there again, that, that's just <clears throat> one little example of someone that, you know, again, uh, Mears' mentor or Mears' mentee and pastor in Gainesville, Texas was so instrumental in the life of this uh, Jim Rayburn that, you know, Young Life was the international was the uh, result of that. And again, stories to be told, all kinds of stories like that. It's amazing that she, as a woman in the 40s and 50s, had such an incredible impact on mothering, if you want to think of it that way, these men, you know, that yeah. were being launched into pastoral yeah. ministries and mm -hmm. that they all looked to her. And I don't, I mean, what was it that she did to them? <laughs> you know, just <laughs> believe in them, love them. I mean, what was it that she, you know, how was it that she had such an incredible impact? Or was it the confidence in her faith? The, you know, what what was so attractive about her or magnetic or whatever? I tried mm -hmm. to see if I could find any YouTube videos so I could listen to her preach. Um, <clears throat> I know that she never preached on Sunday morning in the pulpit. But I hear that Fuller president thought she was the best preacher on the West Coast, and I wanted to hear her, but I couldn't find any videos of her at all. Um, or, They're just audio tapes. Just audio. Just audio and where tapes. do you find those? Can you find those someplace? Well, they were Gospel Light. You know, she founded Gospel Light Publishing back in the 30s, uh, and she founded, you know, back in 33, she was just trying to find a a good Sunday school curriculum for for the Hollywood Church, and she couldn't find one, so she wrote it. She wrote a whole <laughs> curriculum that turned out to be Gospel Light Publishing, that was one of the top four uh, religious publishing houses in the country. 
Um, you know, and it wasn't a denominational. In fact, the Presbyterian Church kind of had struggled with gospel light a little bit. Uh, but again, uh, just thousands of churches around the world use gospel light stuff. And Amy Semple McPherson's church, uh, the Foursquare Church, she would, and a Baptist church, she would allow churches in different denominations to alter a little bit of the curriculum so it would comport with their theological understanding. Now that's pretty amazing, you know. She didn't hold that copyright close to her chest. She said, look, we'll let you guys do some changes if you would like. And the Foursquare Church did that. She was fine with it. So she had a very big tent. I mean, her tent was really large. I mean, she believed in faith healing, Oral Roberts. Uh, a lot of you remember the name Oral Roberts, great faith healer person, founder of uh, Oral Roberts University in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, he was he uh, was at her house a couple of times, at least. Uh, she One of the other faith healers in Southern California would have uh, him sings at her house with Henrietta's college students. So uh, again, very big tent, but it wasn't a tent that included everyone. Again, she had a, a bigger tent than a lot of folks did. Uh, but again, she had boundaries over that. And the boundaries are orthodox uh, theological beliefs. But she had a, uh, her, I think what, what again tells you how big that tent was is back in the 50s. And I can't remember if it was, it, it was in the mid 50s sometime, I think. Uh, but there's this international organ, uh, this national organization, uh, and it's an ecumenical organization. It's uh, uh, United Jewish Women, uh, Protestant Women, and uh, Catholic Women uh, had this. It's called the Mary Margaret O'Brien uh, Award, and it went to the it was, folks nominated for that were women who are most influential in their community. Henrietta Mears got nominated for that in the mid 1950s. Now. Again, this is Jewish women, Catholic women, and Protestant women, national organization. She's nominated for that. At the same time that a lot of other evangelical guys, Harold John Ockengay, the president of Fuller Seminary, uh, Billy Graham, I think, really got jumped on that anti-communist wagon and really kind of wrote it, uh, you know, very, very strongly. She would not speak out again against, com she wasn't, she didn't believe in communism at all. But again, if you're going to start becoming anti-communist, you don't, and that's going to be your public pronouncement, is that what's going to take precedence? And it always had to be the gospel that takes precedence for nothing else. Uh, and so she really, you know, she was much more ecumenical, I think, than a lot of those early evangelicals. And so, again, I think that we in the present day can learn a lot about grace, about uh, uh, inclusivity. Again, not 100 percent inclusivity because she had those boundaries on her. Um, but she did operate with a, a lot of grace, I think. And we could sure use a lot of that in our culture today, couldn't we? Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Well, you know, in the in the intro, if I could add uh, in the read, the, what Luann had written in the email, and she the highlight of one of her successes was um, she negotiated the land right for a forest home. Was that I read that yeah. right? Okay. Well, I'm now coming as a woman executive in male dominated industries my whole life, automobile and then telecom, having been very successful. I'm listening to all this through that, and so in. As, jo as Luann saying, what was it that she did? <laughs> well, you know what? I, and I, I uh, this is how I operated. That to me, executive is a non-gender word. You're either good or you're not. You watch who's good and you emulate that. You watch who's bad and you know what not to do if you stand back and watch the outcome. And I think that there is a trust that they had in her because she kept the truth front Regardless, so you said there was a graciousness that she had with making everyone feel included without selling out because she kept to the word. And then also she had the boldness to go, I've got, you know, a sword in my hand and it's, it's the word of God. And if the Lord is sending me here, I can walk in. So there's a confidence stride that she took in dealing with these these people, whether they were men or women, mm -hmm. that became a non-gender approach to the truth of the word, which is really the truth of the word. It was like how Jesus yeah. operated with the men and the women who followed him. Mm -hmm. So that's, as a woman executive, <laughs> that's how I, that's how I'm hearing it. And, uh -huh. and I can see mm -hmm. how she could be successful without doing anything except for being capable and mm -hmm. efficient and effective of which she was, because all the things that you just talked about that she did, that's big business. I mean, take, <laughs> yeah. take the profit out of it because it was nonprofit. But for any company to have followed her guidelines to form or be influential with all these institutions, that's corporate. That is clean corporate guidelines that she followed. That's you know, because I lived it. Yeah. 
You know, Barbara, one of her sayings was Sunday school is big business. All of her, everything she did started at the local church. Gospel mm -hmm. Light, the Hollywood Christian Group, um, Forest Home, it all started because she wanted to have the most powerful, dynamic, biblically-based Christian education program for all ages she could possibly manage. And all these other things that, that had a worldwide effect all started in the local church, whether it was First Baptist Minneapolis or uh, First Press in Hollywood. And you know what's interesting with you saying that, um, the commentary that you uh, gave us on the father, her father was a businessman. He was a big business. He was a businessman. And she yeah. could stand back and see how he became successful, how he and how he then failed or how the pressures caused things to not come out how the way he wanted it to be. But she used that philosophy that she learned at his feet as an adoring daughter. Probably, mm -hmm. you know, that was who she was to see from and for especially now that you're saying one of her phrases was Sunday school is big business. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it, business it has a bad rap. <laughs> Let me tell oh, you, yeah. the purity of it is, um, it's not, I mean, I kind of, Jesus did this with disciples. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, let's yeah. get one that gets 10, that gets 100, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. yeah. Arlen, do you want to tell us the story of Forest Home? Um, sure. Um, uh, like, again, I, I could talk all night, so I mean, <laughs> you, could, you may have to <laughs> shut me up here, but um, yeah, in... Uh, uh, so, so Gospel Light is launched as a local curriculum for Hollywood First Press in 1933. The church just explodes uh, in terms of membership. She had the biggest uh, Sunday school purportedly in the Presbyterian Church in the entire nation. It went from about 2,000, what, 2,400 when she came in 28 to well over 6,000 by the time that she retired or she, that she passed on. So I mean, it's huge. And again, it's a Sunday school for all ages from, you know, one-year-olds all the way up to, you know, folks that were senior, senior citizens. Um, but one of the things that she believed is that, you know, you can't, it, it, the Christian education program doesn't have to be confined just to Sunday, a morning, that there are other times that we could have uh, for Christian growth and understanding. And one was Wednesday evening, you know, so they had a lot of programs on Wednesday evening, but another was to try to get students away for a while uh, in a retreat. And so mm. in the, uh, actually, was, I think our first year uh, there from 28, 29, that first summer, uh, she tried to find uh, a place where her collegians could go and kind of get away for a weekend and kind of just get a lot of Bible teaching, that sort of thing. And um so she went to a, a place called Switzer's Inlet. I've been there I, well, as a kid, you know, again, I grew up, it's right along Angeles Crest Highway there. Uh, she went to Tokwitz Pines, which is out uh, toward Palm Springs and, and there's Mount San Jacinto there and the Palm Springs tram. Uh, she went to a Presbyterian, took some of her students to a Presbyterian camp near Santa Monica. So she tried all these different places um, but none of them seem to work. And so uh, she started to think, well, may, is there a way that we can get our own campground, not for Hollywood Church, but uh, so we could bring our folks from Hollywood and anywhere else that want to get good Bible teaching. So anyway, there was this uh, resort in um, Mill Creek Valley. It's um, it's near Redlands. It's out of uh, in the in San Bernardino Mountains, out of Redlands. I think it's on the highway to Big Bear now, in fact. But um uh, it's uh, it was a, a resort uh, I think started back in the late 19th century. You know, the people would go there, go there uh, out of uh, Redlands or L.A. if they had a week. They'd take the train there and then spend a few days at the swing pool and you know golfing and that sort of stuff. Um, and so she she heard from one of her parents uh, of her of her uh, high school girls uh, kids. I'm sorry. Uh, that there was that this place was for sale, and the guy that owned it by this time was I think it was a Pasadena architect or something, and he was asking sixty thousand dollars for it or something, and I can't remember how many acres it was, but a lot, I think sixty cabins, you know, and a little miniature golf course and stuff. Well, she couldn't afford sixty. She she actually went up. She was at a conference in San Dimas. That's another conference center she used. So she and a couple of the folks that were at that uh, I think it was a high school conference came down for the weekend went uh, to see this uh, this conference ground and she <laughs> she got out of the car looked around and said let's go back there's no way we can afford this it was just too nice so they went back and that, thought that was it well um in the if the winter of 37 38 there was a tremendous uh series of snowstorms in, uh, in uh, southern california so there was a lot of 
what they say, 10 to 20 feet of snow in the San Bernardino Mountains um, near Big Bear. Uh, so it a lot of snow. And then all of a sudden it warmed up and it started to rain and it warmed up so much. And the rain kept coming down that a lot of that uh, uh, snow melted off the mountains and came roaring down this Mill Creek Valley and just destroyed uh, practically the whole valley. Uh, and that particular storm or that particular event, again, the, the, the uh, uh, stories about it are just phenomenal for people to live there. I mean, they're, they're amazing that they, they lived to survive this thing. It was really horrible. But it took out a lot of the amenities of these various resorts that were in the area. Now, Forest Home, the Forest Home Resort only lost, I think, two cabins, but it just destroyed the uh, all the all the beautiful trees. It was, a, it was a beautiful place. Just tore all the trees out of there, and all the all the uh, wildlife was was gone. And so this guy decided, uh, well, uh, I'll sell two for thirty thousand dollars. So she and two or three of her mentors, and you know the Hormel family that does the meat packing. Yeah, yeah. Well, the yeah. Hormel family was part of that. <laughs> And they bought the they bought it. Um, and Henrietta decided initially she thought, well, let's get let's get the folks from Hollywood Church up here, and then they could each buy a cabin. So it'll be their their um uh, kind of uh, vacation place in the winter uh, summertime. But then she so she had to she had a great turnout. I mean, people came up and they were wanting to uh, to purchase these cabins, and she said, wait a second, if if they purchase all the cabins, where am I going to put the students? I mean, there's no way that we can have a, a camp for kids if we have the, all these families in these cabins. So she said, we can't do that. And decided again to buy it herself with these, these uh, few other folks. Um, and in 1938, they incorporated uh, Forest Home. And uh, now uh, every, every year um, uh, before COVID, uh, there were over 65,000 people that would, uh, from again, young kids right to to uh, senior adults that would come. It was always an interdenominational uh, campground, just like Forest Home. Forest Home was, or not uh, Forest Home, but Gospel Light. They were never denominational. They were never just for for the Presbyterian denomination or Hollywood Church. They were always interdenominational. Um, in fact, I remember meeting a lot of folks from so many different churches when I went to the college briefing conference a few years back in the. Uh, Late 60s and early 70s. Uh, so there's that there's that kind of wide net again. Uh, so she bought Forest Home initially to give a, a place for her students to have to kind of come away and get you know, concentrated Bible teaching. But it was always not just her church; it was anybody who wanted to come and get good Bible teaching. Fantastic! I love this. Yeah, just amazing. So did you see any contradictions? That was one more question I wanted to ask you. I wanted to find out about revivals in America and I wanted to find out about, it seemed to me that she was really happy living the life of privilege, taking three months to go travel the world, having fancy clothes. And it seemed like such a contradiction to me that a godly woman in the 40s or 50s would be so extravagant in some of those ways. Um, so anyway, if, I don't know if you have any thoughts about that or how you explain that. Oh yeah, that's a, I think that's a great uh, a great point. I think again, she's she's human. <laughs> she you know even though even though her father you know again died pretty much penniless. Her family there was all kinds of wealth. One of her bro her favorite brother that I talk quite a bit about ended up being a, a major agent for the Payne Weber uh, in Boston, you know, the, the main wealth management company. Another brother uh, headed a, a company in uh, St. Paul that was a, a very prominent uh, in the St. Paul business community. In fact, there's a Mears Park. If you go downtown in um, St. Paul today, there's a Mears Park right downtown where this business used to be. It's not, it's of course not anymore. Uh, she had an uncle that ran another very important engraving business in Minneapolis. So there was a lot of money around there. I mean, I, I visited all of her homes, the homes she lived in, uh, in Minneapolis. And boy, the last one was really quite nice. Uh, she did take sabbatical. She took an entire year once to go around the world. She took mm -hmm. six or eight trips that were just fun. I mean, any of us would probably <laughs> love to do any, any any one or two of those trips and she did a bunch of them she loved furs she she drove a cadillac uh, so here's that's yeah, our here's girl a woman. <laughs> yeah i love yeah. it <laughs> and, you, and you know what else that gave her entree that gave her cachet yeah. oh, to yeah. talk to anybody in the world 
<laughs> and that's part of it. That that yeah. gave her an entree. Uh, she loved to rub. So I mean, the governor of California, the governor of Oregon, and the governor of Washington were all close to her back in the 1950s. Um, and she, I mean, she she got notes from Dwight Eisenhower <laughs> when he was president. Yeah. I mean, she could run in those kind of circles. So there again, there's there's a, a positive side of that, and there's a potential. Eh, does she really understand how a lot of folks have to live to scrape to get by? You know, uh, and but I think look that's what a great she question. did. But look Pardon what me? she did. For, but but yeah, as yeah. a result of that, she was mm -hmm. able to fund and have uh, strategic um, alliances to be able mm -hmm. to serve the lowest, poorest. Right. And, right, and right. you know, and anyway, that's why I see it as such value. Yeah. Didn't yeah. Billy Graham. It, it, I'm sorry, Sharon. Uh, didn't Billy Graham say like next to Ruth, his wife, Henrietta Mears was the most influential person in his life. Yeah. But I think one thing you had mentioned how she paid attention and each person knew that she truly cared. Mm -hmm. That works then and now, and that's what people are longing for now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that I think that's so much the case for her because I couldn't under see because I think I would have been one of those. Maybe I wouldn't have been a wallflower, but I certainly wouldn't have been a star. You know, I mean, uh, and I think would I have gotten along with her very well because um, she could be real. You know, you talked about the you know the contradictions, Louie, and I think this is not a contradiction that she uh, she didn't tell people where God wanted them to be unless she did. <laughs> That's kind of how I explain it. Some people she didn't. Other folks, she said, you belong in the ministry. I mean, again, a story, Gary Demarest, you know, really, a, he served La Canada Presbyterian Church for years. He's on the board here at Whitworth for years. Just a very, very uh, prominent uh, evangelical Presbyterian, really involved in the national church too in the PCUSA. But Gary Tamaris told me the story. He was he, when he was at Berkeley, he was a student body president. Okay, so there's a, there's a star for you, right? Wow. So he 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 was in a quartet uh, that sang at um, Mount Hermon in the Bay Area there, mm -hmm. uh, and Henry had happened to be at that conference. And she came up to, the, to Gary Demers later. And so she, she hadn't met him before, right? She goes up to meet him and she said, young man, do you know God wants you in the ministry? And he just, you can imagine, I mean, who are you? I mean, yeah. like, I don't even know who you are. And you're saying, well, guess what? She was right. Um, <laughs> he ended up in the ministry. He was, in fact, he, he after he graduated engineering at, at Berkeley, he came down to Southern California. And I think he worked at, he was a civil engineer, uh, but only, and then he started going to Hollywood Church and she kept saying, you're young man, you're head for the ministry. I think he worked at that job in Pasadena for a year or two, and then he dropped out, went to seminary, and there you have it. Wow. So. Yeah. And you know, I have you. You're begging this opening for me to tell you that this wallflower that you saw yourself as back, if you had been there, she chose you to do this amazing study <laughs> on her and your life devoted to it. <laughs> Thanks, Barbara. You're no let, me just, let me just tell you one more story. I, I, there's so many of these. I mean, I had to look so many out of the book too because it was. <laughs> I had to cut fifty thousand words out of the book. So. Oh my um, god. But she tells this other story about, you know, what she's trying again to have this wide net, to cast this wide net. And when she became part, uh, when she started help uh, found the Hollywood Christian group, a lot of Christians were just anti Hollywood just from the get go, just because it was Hollywood. You know, there were plenty of controversies in the 20s about Hollywood, too. I mean, lots of really sordid stuff. And so, in the context of that, uh, I mean, there were there were uh, signs in uh, all around Hollywood that said, you know, actors and dogs need not apply. <laughs> you, you can't stay at this apartment. You know, we won't let you if you're an actor. Um, but she, you know, she she again tried to befriend these folks, work with them, um, and yet she said she confessed at one time. She said, you know, I can't really wear makeup when I go to speak in a church because if people knew that I wore makeup or earrings or lipstick or something, they wouldn't let me in their church. Mm -hmm. So she deferred a lot of her freedom to dress in those kinds of ways, although she did, she did dress in furs. Yeah, me, so. but, yeah, yeah, so there's, there again, is a, a paradox, right? Uh, but she, she really, she said, I, I want to make sure these people hear me, so I'm not going to wear lipstick. I'm not going to wear makeup. Um, and um, again, it just shows you, Again, yeah. how powerful that sense of. Can I say something? Mm -hmm. All through your all through your talk, 
um, I've been struck by the similarity between what Paul taught and how he operated and yes. Henrietta Mears. Yeah. And, and so I think that's a big part of her success. I agree, Ruth. And yeah. I don't think it was, I don't know that it was necessarily intentional. It's just, if she believed the Bible, she just thought this is how it was. Yeah. Well, I think it was Ruth. I mean, she taught Paul's epistles all the time. Romans was her favorite book. Uh -huh. She Ooh. taught Romans all the time. So she, she, that's interesting. You could pick that up just from our conversation because she very much was a, uh, a Pauline scholar. I mean, again, she mm -hmm. didn't, she didn't have a theology degree. She only had a four-year degree in chemistry from University of Minnesota, but she learned scripture and she taught it and she taught Paul uh, all the time. She loved Paul. Mm -hmm. oh, I love knowing that. What a great uh, comment, Ruth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It seems that she wasn't rude. She That's wasn't, correct. She was not. No. Well, there's so well, much yeah. rudeness today. Oof. Yeah. Yeah. I think that there's again a, a, a I, I would I would agree almost 100 percent with you, Sharon, but there were times. And I talk about this in the 10th chapter where I, it's just titled Paradoxes and Limitations. Again, she's human. So there were there were right. a few cases where she really, if she thought, for example, the faith was compromised or family mm -hmm. or friends were compromised, she would come out swinging. Yeah, uh, the that's best okay. example of that, yeah, the, there's a, the best example that would be a guy named Jim Voss. Now, we probably don't recognize that name, but he was a big deal back in the 40s. Um, he was a, he, he wasn't, he wasn't in telecommunications, but he was in electronics. So he, he, he developed, um, a lot of wiretapping technology and actually he was employed by the LA, uh, I think it was, uh, the LA police, um, as well as the mob, uh, to wiretap. Uh, so he was working oh. both sides of the coin. He okay. dated, um, Henrietta Mears's niece for a while. And Henrietta Mears looked at him and said, this guy has real potential. This is before this, all this hit the fan, right? He's a college student, uh, actually got kicked out of the Bible Institute of Los Angeles. Uh, he was quite a, quite an uh, amazing guy. Anyway, um, she, he was actually president of the college department and uh, was dating her niece for a while. And then he, I guess he dumped her. And then some of this other stuff started, started to come out and she was just incensed. Jim Voss was another one of those people at the 49 Crusade that became a Christian. He finally had said, okay, this is, I, I've got to get my life together. He and Jim Voss and Stuart Hamlin and Zamperini, Louis Zamperini were three that at the end of the crusade, that's why one of the reasons the crusade was extended so long, because you get these people that were just, had amazing stories. Well, Jim Voss went back to Henrietta, asked for her forgiveness, and she never forgave him. I mean, again, I don't know the ins and outs of that, but I do know that after he died, his son was talking to, to a mutual friend of, of uh, Henrietta. And uh, well, I guess it was I guess Voss himself before he died. He said, you know, I, I just have never been able to get back uh, in her good graces. And um, he told me that the fellow that he taught, said this to said she could be that way. Uh, but I think it was very rare. And I think it was those occasions where, again, either the faith was was threatened by someone that she had, you know, thought would be a, a, a good leader or her family or her friends. The family. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's when she, that's when she really came out. Yeah. Uh, but that's mm -hmm. the only time, you know, these other things, she, she, it is pretty amazing. I mean, there were limits to her sense of grace too, just like there is for all of us. And yeah. um, that, that makes her maybe even all the more amazing when you think of what, what she was able to accomplish uh, again in, uh, in her ministry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Very good. Well, thank you. I so appreciate you willing to come talk to us and share yes, your, thank your you. love with us. <laughs> oh, my pleasure. Nice it's to been meet a you. Joy. Lady. Such a joy. It's a pleasure to meet you too. Yeah. So all the best in your continued ministry. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Luann. Yeah. Um, so very much. Well, why don't we just close in prayer and then we can um, go on about our day. <laughs> uh, dear Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this woman, um, Henrietta Mears, and for mm -hmm. Arlen um, giving so much time to our, um, documenting her life so that the rest of us can um, read her I will statements and can read her 
um, the steel that was in her soul that she just was so faithful to want to present the gospel and to do everything she could for people to come to know Jesus. And I prayed that a little bit of her um, strength and her perseverance and her confidence would rub off on us and that we too would um, be faithful to follow you all the way to the end. So thank you so much for the work that Arlen has done and for the, yes. um, yes. the really enjoyable hour and a half we've spent together. So thank you, Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you all. Thank you. Yes. Yes. So thank, you. thank you. Yes. yes. So thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you so, so much, Arlen. So what are we doing now? Leaving? <laughs> you can leave if you want. Who wants to go first? <laughs> Bye-bye, you all. I love okay. seeing you again. Yeah, nice so, okay. Thank you, Arlen. Thank you so much. You yeah. Good night. Thanks, Arlen. Good night. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, Barbara Willett, Luann Bud. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Bye, sister. Thank you so much for everything. Oh, all right, God. darling. Okay. Nice to see you, Sharon. Nice to see you too, Luann. Yeah. yeah. I watched Marty's, you know, the funeral for Walt on Saturday, and oh my goodness. Oh, so sad. Oh, oh yeah. yeah for her so if you see her give her a hug for me oh i uh, want to get with her and uh with ruth ann because i know ruth ann's been by her side yeah and uh i was telling barbara in a text my darling mother used to always say the aftercare the yeah. aftercare is yeah. what mm -hmm. yeah so i want to make sure i can connect with them and um we can do something i can treat them to whatever dinner, nice. lunch, yeah. uh, you know, because uh, Leela, who was our other little partner and friend with us back in the day, she's up in uh, Camarillo now. Hmm. So she lives up there. So I want to do that. Bless her sweetheart. Mm. Yeah, yeah there's so much that we know goes on with leading up to that day, to mm -hmm. yesterday, you know, and then everything gets quiet. Yeah. yeah. And so to be certain about following up and, you know, reaching out is so important. Yeah. I want to introduce you guys to my friend Ruth. Ruth. Hi, Ruth. <laughs> Ruth was in our church. Now she lives up in Bellingham, oh. uh, Washington State. And this is Sharon and Barbara. They both live in the L.A. Oh, Barbara's moved now, so she's living down south. I'm in San Diego County, but I'm an L.A. girl forever yeah. because I keep my tentacles into my girl, my sister Sharon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And Ruth, yeah, is, we, Ruth's dad lives down in San Bert. Uh, where's your dad, Ruth? Oh, is she? She's stuck. Oh, no. Oh, did she click oh, out? There she is. In San Dimas, is your dad in San Dimas, Ruth? Is, is she uh, new? My brother's in San Dimas and my dad's in Duarte. Oh, in Duarte. Okay. So okay. She, she gets down there every month to take care of her dad. Um, oh, yeah. Down there. So she's down in you guys. And my mom and dad were married at Forest uh, Home. Oh, they wow. were. Oh, no I'm kidding. What a great legacy. Oh, I love that. <clears throat> that woman had what you would call the Midas touch, it seems. Oh, oh. yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I wanted to know about her prayer life. You know? Oh, oh. We shouldn't have asked him. We'll have to have yeah. him come back. <laughs> Send him an email and an share email. with us. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> what did he? Wow. Oof, yeah. That's great. Mm -hmm. I'm going to stop the recording here.